What's up guys, Derek more Police more Today we're gonna to be talking about prostaglandin D2 antagonists, uh, abbreviated as PGD2 antagonists more often. And the most promising compounds in this class for hair loss prevention are, um, the main ones are SETI Piperont, Fevi Piperont, and OC000459. So these are the, you know, most notable ones in this community as well as probably the strongest ones with Fevi being significantly more powerful than SETI, but also far more cost prohibitive. And frankly, all of these are cost prohibitive for most people. So far to date, I have used a low, moderate, and a high dose of SETI Piperon and OC. And OC is commonly you know, seen as more powerful than SETI, especially milligram for milligram, it's a lot stronger. Um, SETI, I worked my way all uh, all the way up to a few grams orally per day, um, as well as tried it topically. OC, I've used it topically. Didn't try it orally, but um, topical was kind of the farthest I wanted to go with that one. It's a lot more potent milligram for milligram. And then FEVI is uh, something I haven't even delved into just because I figured I could just dose my SETI higher and see if there's even any sort of, you know, potential in this class of compound to really push the boundaries in terms of, um, you know, more inhibition or more antagonistic activity. So basically the function of these compounds without making too elaborate of a de detailed video deep dive explaining it, these compounds work by inhibiting an inflammatory response to what is presumed to be androgens. So the cascade of events is hypothesized to be starting with you know androgens binding to androgen receptors and there is a downstream cascade of events that eventually leads to the final outcome of hair follicle miniaturization so a lot of you know scientists and chemists and what whatnot have basically over the years tried to figure out okay clearly inhibiting 5 alpha reductase isn't you know an end all be all and it can be side effect ridden for a lot of people inhibiting androgen receptors can be side effect ridden for some people. So like there's people that have been trying to address different areas of the cascade of events. Cause in theory, even if you don't inhibit androgens whatsoever, if you can target whatever downstream occurs as a consequence of that androgen receptor activation, you could in theory prevent the hair follicles from getting miniaturized while still maintaining completely normal androgen receptor activation, endogenous androgen production, not have to inhibit 5AR, not have to inhibit androgen receptors, none of that kind of stuff. So this is what this treatment option really owned in on is the theory that basically it was found in the clinical data that prostaglandin D2, PGD2 was found elevated in men with balding scalps. And in addition to that, when you expose um, hair follicles to PGD2 on purpose, they miniaturize. And on the other hand, PGE2 is found to be less present in balding scalps and is found to have a um, agonist effect in terms of hair growth, which is largely why I've talked about castor oil before. It's sort of one of the mechanisms proposed to be behind how minoxidil works. So if you didn't already know PGE2, more or less, they're like counteracting balancing act um, prostaglandin. So PGE2 promotes relaxation, kind of like the literally the relaxation of tissues throughout the body. And this is why it's used to induce labor at very high dosages. This is why a high dose of castor oil is used to induce labor as well as um, as a laxative. And in turn, it also can, in theory, relax the scalp tension that occurs as a you know downstream cascade of events from androgens and promote more hair growth that would otherwise not be possible. And PGD2 is seen as the counter, you know, the opposite side of the spectrum of PGE2, where it is a constricting inflammatory agent essentially, whereby if it's elevated in bald scalps, it's literally a marker of inflammation in the body, and it's the one that causes a constriction of tissues, you know, it's very logical how somebody might come to the conclusion that PGD2 could be a very novel approach to addressing androgenic alopecia that is totally, you know, irrelevant to having to tackle androgens or 5AR or anything like that. So obviously it had a lot of therapeutic promise and it has gone through clinical testing with SETI, with OC, with FEVI. Um, 
and they're trying to get, they have different, you know, applications, much like how minoxidil also lowers blood pressure. I'm sure like you'll start to realize is when you delve into this stuff that a lot of things have effects in many different areas of the body. So for example, minoxidil, a vasodilating agent, which also lowers blood pressure. When you take, you know, NO precursors in your pre-workout, what's, you know, one of the byproduct consequences of that, it can drop your blood pressure while increasing blood flow, which increases oxygenation and, you know, blood flow to tissues. There's like a very predictable outcome with these medications that often have different applications in a therapeutic clinical setting. So the PGD2 inhibitors, they're also being looked at for, you know, um, airway inhibition. So like asthma, stuff like that. Anything that has to do with, you know, promoting relaxation in an otherwise, you know, somebody who has a predisposition to or autoimmune reaction to some sort of thing that causes a constricting effect or hyper amounts of inflammation. It's kind of like there's many different applications for these same drugs. But anyways, one of the much like minoxidil, one of the other applications potentially of these PGD2 inhibitors could be, you know, preventing the vasoconstriction, preventing the uh, hypoxia of the hair follicle essentially. And in practical application though, does it work? So I've tried it, like I mentioned, um, the clinical data unfortunately was not overly promising. And on top of that, I didn't notice a big benefit at all, if anything, to be honest. So I did an experiment where I didn't do anything, came off of everything and just used SETI and I used a very high dose of it orally. Didn't I didn't notice any benefit from it. It didn't stave off further loss. It didn't induce any regrowth whatsoever. Not that I would expect regrowth. That would be a fringe benefit, if anything. But I was hoping I could at least stave off loss with it, which did not seem to be the case, perhaps. One thing I should note, though, is I do know people in this community that are credible, that I do trust and are unbiased, that do swear by it and think it does work very well and they are side effect free. Personally, I had no side effects either. I also know some people who it's worked for, but they had pretty bad side effects where typically one of the main side effects of PGD2 inhibitors is um, having issues falling asleep or getting to sleep and staying asleep. Um, that is one of the main things. And then on top of that, you know, you're talking about, it's one of those things, again, there's always a, a reaction to whatever you're doing in your body. So if you inhibit, you know, a very significant inflammatory process in your body downstream, is that going to have effects on other things that require PGD2 to balance out? You know what I mean? So typically in things that have to do with vasodilation or anything like that, typically there's an increased risk of cancer. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, things that <laughs> kill off cancer are often um, cardio and neurotoxic. It's kind of like a balancing act of everything. And typically you'll find these treatments that either vasoconstrict, vasodilate, do this, do that. They seem to have, you know, they have an inherent risk and there are other, you know, side effects that come along with that. Like I mentioned with the sleep. So I'm not going to say that any of this stuff is going to happen. If you use it, I'm just saying, make sure you're aware of the actual mechanism of action and how, what it's supposed to facilitate in your body other than in the scalp, because just like finasteride, just like topical antiandrogens, just like anything else you might use, it's wise to be able to predict if something happens, what kind of effect is that gonna have on other physiologic processes in the body? Because at the end of the day, it's not like everything has to do with what's going on up here. If you're inhibiting 5AR and you're inhibiting AR, there's other things in the body that are going to be affected as a consequence of that. So whether you see the physical manifestation of side effects or not, it's kind of like you should still not just assume, oh, you know, I have too much PGD2 in my scalp, so it's a problem. So I'm like helping the rest of my body by, you know, lowering it might not necessarily be the case. You know what I mean? So it's uh, definitely something to be at least aware of. So, you know, and can predict what's going to happen in other tissues in the body and not just the scalp, because at the end of the day, health is still number one, regardless of how aggressive and experimental some of our treatment options or you know experiments might be that we're trying to do here, at least be cognizant and like understanding of what's going on everywhere else. So then you have a better risk management like assessment going into it, because some people, once they actually see like with finasteride, for example, what could potentially happen to 
other things in the body that they were unaware of prior to starting it just by getting handed a prescription by a doctor, perhaps they would have not taken that medication had they seen their comprehensive blood work, had they known that they're right on the borderline of you know, estrogen dominance or androgen deficiency, should they have known they already have high SHBG and have a likelihood of you know, um, crushing their free DHT, which is in turn going to probably result in um, you know, post-finasteride syndrome or whatever manifestation of side effects you have as a consequence of what you're using, you need to just understand drugs before you put them in your system is what I'll, all I'm trying to say. So as far as, you know, OC, apparently from what I've seen, again, I tried OC as well. I didn't try it orally. I tried it topically though. I didn't find any benefit whatsoever. Um, I know individuals personally who I trust who did find a huge benefit from it though. And on top of that, Many of them had the same side effects from SETI as they did with OC. So it's, you know, a similar mechanism of action. As far as FEVI, I don't know anyone who's tried it personally, but um, I believe it failed its most recent clinical trial. And frankly, I'm not too, you know, bullish on the whole PGD2 antagonist class of compounds anyways. I think that, uh, you know, time and time again, we've seen the most, uh, you know, efficacious treatment option is tackling androgen receptor activation in some capacity, whether it's depleting androgens via 5AR, whether it is, you know, tackling the actual AR activation itself, just like the beginning of the cascade, I feel like has more promise around it, at least in terms of like backed, you know, years of showing results and like ta like actual noticeable results not people just saying oh like i started this treatment i see like little vellus hairs like showing up like actual good results the only thing i really see in the cascade is things that address the frontline issue basically but that doesn't mean you couldn't in theory if something worked better for you throughout you know later in the cascade it doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. And it also doesn't mean that you couldn't perhaps use a lower dose of something earlier in the cascade that doesn't manifest side effects and a lower dose of something, you know, later in the cascade that kind of works in conjunction to make a more comprehensive amount of protection with a relative lack of side effects than you would otherwise get with a higher dose of one or the other. Do you know what I'm saying? So anyways, do they work? It seems like they do for some. However, I don't think it's as, I think it's more hit or miss than other treatments that we uh, have come to know about already. So anyways, take that with a grain of salt. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe. Check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplates underscore more dates. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, BitChute, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, wherever I am. Highly recommend you guys subscribe to the mailing list. The first link in the description below, it will sign you up to get uh, sent all the articles as soon as I publish them, which are far more concise, uh, broken down with like professional subsections with studies linked to, to everything I'm referring to that you can delve into further yourself for your own personal research. So highly recommend you sign up for that because you won't get emailed those articles otherwise. So, and they're more high quality in my videos, in my opinion. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.